I asked my young son a question. What do you want to be when you grow up? And he said, Daddy, excitedly, I want to be a train driver or an aeroplane pilot. But how do I tell him the truth? Do we have a duty of care as parents to be entirely candid and honest with our children? How do I tell him in an artificial intelligence-powered future the very essence of our jobs, our dignity, and our pride is at stake. In fact, in the next 15 years, as many as 30% of our existing jobs could be automated by artificial intelligence and related technology. It was in this moment that it dawned on me that these stories about AI as espoused in science fiction, they're not really stories at all, they're certainly not fiction, and they're certainly not artificial. They're very real stories. And if I'm serious about preparing my children for this future that we can't exactly foresee, I need to start sharing this story with them right now. AI could be one of the most transformative things that will happen to humans of all time. AI is already here more than most people realize. It powers the smartphones in your, in, and the maps in your smartphone. It recommends the movies you might next watch on Netflix. And in, increasingly, in the course of the next few years, AI will start moving from simply assisting us to augmenting vast arrays of our lives. We'll start seeing AI increasingly diagnosing diseases, discovering new drugs for rare diseases. It will start optimizing the energy systems. It will manage the traffic flows in our cities. It will start producing hyper-personalization of products and services that we buy. And once we've embraced this augmentation phase of AI, we'll start moving forward to this autonomous future with self-driving cars, with supply chains that provide the products to you before you even realize that you need them. And even the prospect of robots, intelligent robots, performing surgery on you. It's quite a lot to look forward to in the years ahead. And this could lead to substantial economic growth. A recent forecast we produced suggested that by 2030, this could add an additional $16 trillion to the world economy. So this is happening now and in the years ahead. So we've also got a huge number of opportunities to solve some of the grandest challenges in the world. For example, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Can you picture a world in the years ahead that's free from poverty, is free from chronic disease? You've got a world to look forward to potentially providing education for all and a stable climate and a healthy environment. I think that's something we should all aspire to deliver upon. So I advise governments and businesses on the implications of this technology, the way that we should harness this responsibly, be mindful of the implications, and ensuring we have the appropriate policies and standards and rules in place to ensure that future generations benefit from this positively. But I'm also a father, I'm a, I'm a dad to three young kids of eight and six and nearly two years old, and I often dwell upon the future we're creating now that they will inherit in the years to come. It's quite a lot to think about, and uh, you keep posing yourself this question, what are you going to be when you grow up? I remember um, having this conversation as a young child with my mum, and uh, the question at the time she posed me was answered normally with a sensible response. I aspire to be the chairman of Ford Motor Company, we had a clapped out old Ford Fiesta, so the sensible idea was to become the chairman of Ford so that I could buy her a Ford Fiesta, a brand new one, the gold 1.3 litre gear. I thought that was quite an admirable aspiration to have. In actual fact, I've got a confession to make. My big dream in life was to become Optimus Prime out of Transformers. I actually believed I was a robot for a number of years, and maybe you might think my presentation is still the same. <laughs> Um, unfortunately, this dream was cruelly dashed when I went into A&E for an x-ray on, on a sprained ankle, and it turned out merely to be flesh and blood. My hopes were torn asunder. Um, I've been thinking quite a lot about my mum of recent times, and uh, in fact, um, uh, several years ago, I very sadly lost her to motor neuron disease, or, or ALS, uh, a cruel disease. And uh, I've seen also a huge number of breakthroughs in this technology with AI, the ability to discover new drugs five times faster than humans can do at the moment. And there's already some uh, British companies, in fact, looking at how do we solve specifically MND. I also think very much about the question she asked me about what I wanted to be when I grow up, and I'm probably still trying to find that out at the moment, to be honest. Um, so I got home from uh, work one day after one of these amazing conferences discovering the possibilities of this technology 
and asked my young son, Dylan, what do you want to be when you grow up? And he's answered, he wants to be an airplane pilot or a train driver. Without thinking, I just blurted out, well, those jobs won't exist in 20 years' time when you're looking for a job. The robots will do that. Cue huge tears, hysterics. He stormed off to his bedroom, totally dejected, and I spent the remainder of the day trying to row back my original statement. But I thought, I need to have this conversation with him and the rest of the kids. So I thought, I need another go at this. So where do you go to for inspiration for your children's upbringing? Well, presumably the school. So the next week, I said to him, go to school, get a book on technology. And I scribbled this word out on a scrap of paper, put it into his school book. Later that day, he's come home. We're doing bedtime reading together. And he produces a new book. The first chapter was how to send a fax. <laughs> now, this wasn't the history section, by the way. This was actually current affairs, rather worryingly. Uh, I'm privileged to work with some incredibly smart people from across the, the world in this field of AI, and uh, I've not met anyone yet that's forecasting a boom in the growth of fax machine engineers in any time soon. So I thought, this isn't a great start. How are we preparing our kids in the schooling system for this uncertain future? I thought, back to the drawing board. We need another go at this. So uh, what do kids love? If your kids and nephews and nieces and grandchildren are anything like mine, they love mainly to steal my mobile phone, download a game on it, play it till the batteries bled dry, and hand it back saying, thanks, Daddy. So I thought I'd use this to my advantage. And in the course of my work, I had come across an amazing game produced by MIT in the US called The Moral Machine. And this game, it poses ethical conundrums for you to look at in terms of an AI-powered self-driving car, a very real uh, implication facing us in the years to come. And uh, it, it basically uh, crowdsources the opinions to understand how do you imbue ethics into decision-making in cars in life and death situations. So let's have a look at one of the games that the kids played. So you can see here, you've got a car self-driving, three women, two young kids, <coughs> barreling towards certain death against this barrier. And crossing the road illegally, I hasten to add, are four elderly people and a woman. So what did the kids decide to do? They swerve, they take out the people crossing the road illegally. So you work through about 12 of these scenarios, and it provides you with a whole set of analysis about what your propensity is for the preservation of life. <laughs> so let's just unpick some of these. Now, the one that really stood out to me, and we are in the, uh, the Living Planet Center, my kids have a strong preference for the preservation of animals over humans. I thought, very noble indeed. And uh, the other one that I'm very proud about, they have a very strong preference for upholding the law. So clearly my parenting skills are actually okay. Now these rules aren't perfect, clearly it's a bit of a gimmick, but it has certainly given me and certainly the kids a glimpse of this future that we can't exactly foresee. And um, I think with that glimpse, you do right realize that kids, even though quite a tender age, do have the capability to understand the implications and comprehend some of these really difficult situations that we are absolutely going to face in the years ahead. But I thought I'd keep going down this track. I wasn't quite convinced that I kind of got the message here. Um, back in uh, March of this year, I had the privilege of being appointed to a parliamentary advisory board that was convened in order to look at some of these UK policy issues to understand how do we uh, responsibly adopt this technology. The first session back in March was very much a high-level view to uh, bring about a dozen MPs and Lords up to speed on the question, what is AI? And uh, you know, I write a lot of reports at work. The first one I produced was perfectly credible and professional, but it was probably not really resonating with me and uh, my colleagues that were presenting this information. So the day before, getting a little bit anxious, I thought I needed some inspiration here. I thought, who better to ask than the very people whose lives will be most impacted by this technology? So we cleared the dishes away after Sunday lunch. Uh, we sat down, and I said to the kids, kids, what does AI mean to you? And after a few seconds of bewildered silence and probably some serious concern for my welfare, my, uh, my daughter asked me, my other daughter said, but daddy, what is AI? That's a good question. Imagine if you have robots with brains in them that can decide to do things for themselves. What sort of issues does that challenge, you know, and what sort of implications does that bring? And we had the most amazing, fun, inspiring chat for about 15 minutes, uh, you know, tossing around all these different scenarios of if robots could do X, Y, and Z. Well, after about 15 minutes, they've got a new game where they go to get my Amazon Alexa, 
and they've created a new language called Goblin that they used to train to confuse the Alexa. So they went off and did that for another 15 minutes afterwards. But it was an interesting chat, and it gave me some initial ideas. Nonetheless, I was still a little bit anxious as I uh, prepared to leave the next day to head to a quite important day in Parliament. And uh, just as I was about to make for the front door, my daughter came up to me and said, Daddy, please can you show this to the bosses of the world? We've written some robot rules for you to go and show them. Let's just unpick these rules if you'd uh, humor me for a moment. Bad people should not build robots. Now, we've seen a lot of stories in the press of late where AI has gone bad. It's led to damaging outcomes. We've seen situations where recruitment AI has led to it preferring men over women in the workplace. We've seen chatbots that have been trained by the public and they've ended up becoming racist. And we've even seen recently in the last month the facial recognition AI that's able to determine if you're straight and gay. Can you just imagine the implications that this technology has already? This is not in you know, 15 years' time. On the flip side, however, all of us have bias. And there is a great opportunity with AI to uphold human rights, to think about how do we uh, mitigate the risks of bias and improve equality in the country. There's a, really, it's an interesting uh, area of AI because um, the AI is very much a production of our own inherent biases. It reflects how we are from within. And the workforce at the moment is very homogenous. So in order to build great AI that is representative of all parts of society, we have to have a workforce that is also representative of all parts of society to ensure that it uh, is, is going to produce the outcomes we want. Rule number two, there has to be an off switch. Now, I don't know if anyone's seen in the press recently, we've had luminaries in academia and Elon Musk pointing out this category of what we call AI safety. What happens if this technology becomes so smart that it takes over? It finishes all off and it removes us all from, the, uh, from, from their, uh, you know, their point of view. Now, there's a number of people that say, well, hang on. If it's just technology, if it starts going rogue, we just pull the plug out, we turn the switch off. However, if it becomes so smart, and one estimate forecasts that if we see exponential growth in the power of this technology, in 20 years' time, it will be 8,000 times more powerful than it is today. So what might be quite a dumb... Siri chatbot in your phone at the moment would be 8,000 times more powerful. It might just have deduced that its power supply is a major point of vulnerability, and it would have taken the necessary countermeasures to protect its own self-interests. This is all under this category of existential risk, these long-range risks that threaten the very much um, of humanity. Um, from my point of view, however, though, I think it's important to focus on these long-range risks, but also to focus very much on how this is already affecting our lives for good and for worse. Rule number three, there shouldn't be bombs in robots. Now, this is a very interesting situation. We've got a situation where we've got weaponized um, robots in drones as a mainstay of modern warfare. I've had to tell the kids that we're breaking this rule already. But we're now moving into this field of autonomous weapon systems, weapons that can decide who to selectively kill on their own terms. And uh, there's been a number of issues, and, and it's been raised by people around the world. There's an open letter signed by 20,000 people uh, looking at how we start tackling this. And ask the question, should we delegate responsibility for selecting who lives and who dies to an autonomous system, or should that always be the preserve of humans? And finally, rule number four, robots should not look like humans. So this is a really contentious question. I mean, many of you will have seen these things in the press of late. On the plus, plus side of this, um, you take countries like Japan that have a very aging workforce, uh, an aging population, a shortfall in the social care and healthcare workforce. They provide a very practical solution to resolving some of that and also providing a novel method of companionship. On the other hand, there's a real concern about the attribution of human characteristics to this technology, something called anthropomorphism. And if we start uh, giving this away, if we don't protect what makes us humans, you know, the ability to have empathy, to care and to love, it has a real risk that it affects the very fabric of life. So that was pretty uh, inspiring. I took that away, had a wonderful day uh, in Parliament. Um, as, I, as I left the house and got to the station, I'm quite addicted to Twitter, I'll, I'll, I'll be honest, and uh, I posted this, and it exploded with retweets and likes and comments from around the world, and that continued to grow throughout the day. And um, I got home that day, and they said, kids, 200,000 people from around the world have read your rules, and it's growing day by day. They're absolutely fascinated by this. I've been rather overwhelmed by the discussion that's since happened. Uh, it's been blogged about, it's been featured at conferences, 
Um, it's been gently challenged you know, in open discussions. Um, it, someone even cheekily suggested it could be a good replacement for Isaac Asimov's Three Laws of Robotics. <laughs> so uh, kudos, kids. Um, and then the highlight of this was that um, Professor Noel Sharkey from BBC Robot Wars also endorsed it. And uh, there's Noel and I in Parliament. Sorry, we'll get back to that. Signing the rules into effect. So what this has really shown me is that actually kids are very, very capable of comprehending some of these big questions that humanity has to ask. They will be the ones that will be inheriting this. Maybe rather than teaching kids to become something, we have to trust them that they should be able to find their own way to think through these big, complex problems. And uh, from, from my perspective, I think we now need to start hardwiring this into the school curricula. I think we should speak to our MPs about this. We should speak to our school teachers about this. We are not in need to produce a whole army of fax machine engineers. Looking back uh, over this uh, last six months or so, it's really taught me one thing. If we really are serious about this, we need to engage our children. However, we also need to include all parts of society. Everyone across all walks of life have to contribute to the way that we shape and govern and rule this technology so it's in our interests. But in particular, I think we should have to include our kids in this. Who better to write the robot rules? Thank you. <laughs>